Today on Encore, an icon of film and fashion. I can't believe we're having this conversation. Oscar-winning <laughs> actor Tilda Swinton works with the world's most gifted directors. Jim Jarmusch, Wes Anderson, Bong Joon-ho and the Coen brothers. Her latest film is her third with British director Joanna Hogg, The Eternal Daughter. Mum, we're here. We'd like to check in, please. Tilda Swinton, hello. Hello, Eve. Are you feeling happy today? I am. I'm a little uh, amazed that I'm awake because I came on a long flight yesterday, but I'm, I am happy. I'm, I'm kept awake by this sofa. <laughs> You're here in Paris to promote your new film. What does Paris mean to you? Well, friends, mainly. Um, I've, I've only ever been happy in Paris, so that's a nice association. The Eternal Daughter follows on from the souvenir one and two. Um, that you did with Joanna Hogg, and you actually share your first experience of film together. Um, you starred in her thesis project, Caprice, mm -hmm. in 1986. Yeah. How did you two meet? We met at school when I was 10 and she was 11. We've just been sort of pretty bonded at the hip ever since. The two of us were sort of making films then, uh, not that we had a camera or that we knew anything really about cinema, but we were always looking and observing, and I feel that we're kind of drawing on that now. And after Caprice with Joanna, you went on to make um, experimental and collective films with Derek Jarman. Mm -hmm. You made nine films in nine years, mm -hmm. but apparently you didn't ever want to be an actor. What did you want to be? Uh, I was a poet when I was a young person. I even got my place at university as a poet, and it's a mark of great uh, shame and embarrassment to me that I stopped writing poetry the second I became a student. <laughs> Um, your films all seem to be collaborative and the result of long creative friendships. Joanna Hogg, Jim Jarmusch, Wes Anderson, Boon Jong Ho, the Coen brothers. For you, is that what filmmaking is? Above all, um, a thing of friendship, hanging out with your kindred spirits? It is. It, 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 I mean, it, it's what my roots were. It was the way I started my practice uh, in filmmaking was collective. I don't know how to operate as a sort of professional. I don't really have a sense of an individual career. I was grown in a collective garden, and I, the miracle for me is that I've been able to continue this way of working since Derek died, because when he died in 94, I could easily have been really high and dry, and no one else would have wanted to work in that way, but I'm very fortunate that there are other people who are, who are willing to play in that sandbox. The longer we're here, the more it comes back. What sort of memory? I just want you to be happy. I just, I'm trying. I'm not sure I feel I have a right to do such a thing. It feels like trespassing. It's not your fault. In The Eternal Daughter, you play both of the main characters, um, Julie and Julie's mum, Rosalind. And it's not the first time you play more than one role in the same film. Suspiria, Orlando, Hale, Caesar, um, Okjar. Why do you like playing multiple characters in the same film? Orlando is about a young man who goes to sleep one night and wakes up a, a woman, but, but is one person. And in many ways, all these multiple refractions uh, that I've approached uh, have been about one refracted person. So the twins in Okja are two faces of capitalism, if you like, and the, the characters in Suspiria are sort of super ego, ego and id. There's, a, there's always some kind of uh, way in which they feel like the same person. And in this film, it's just even more delicate because when you've seen the film, you'll understand why it needed to be the same person playing these two people. I find it um, odd that anyone would think it would, would be odd to want to work in this way. I, it's very natural to me. Your film, We Need to Talk About Kevin, is one of the films that most traumatised me <laughs> in my life. How much of who you are as a mother and as a daughter is in The Eternal Daughter? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know that I'm even qualified to judge that. There are strands of the material that we approach in The Eternal Daughter that Joanna and I have been discussing since we were 10 and 11, the sort of mystery of our mothers. That was a very early bond between us, that we found our mothers mystery people. And there's a moment in The Eternal Daughter when Julie says, you are like a mystery person to me. Uh, that's very personal. 
One of the reasons why Julie and Rosalind are the women in The Eternal Daughter is because we'd worked with them, we'd cooked them up, if you like, in the, in the souvenir films. Can you lend me a couple of quid? Yeah, sure. Mommy, can I borrow some money, please? More money? Yes. Oh. And Joanna also gave your daughter, Anna, her first um, film role in The Souvenir. You played your daughter's on-screen mother. Yeah. What was that like? Very, very easy and delightful and very natural. And we were looking for someone to play uh, this young woman and we, Joanna was very clear that she didn't want an actress, she didn't want someone who wanted to be an actress, she wanted a sort of real young woman who was somewhat you know, self-conscious in front of the camera and was much more interested in the idea of being a filmmaker, in fact. Honor was literally the last person we thought of. I mean, we'd been around the houses and thought of all her friends, her cousins, all sorts of people. But finally, she was the perfect person and she just fell into it. To do such a thing, it feels like trespassing. I need to talk about the dogs. I've just got a puppy. What make of puppy? I got a crossbreed mm -hmm. Doberman. And border collie. Oh, that's a nice mix. It was an, I think it was an accident. You must never ever let them hear you say that. But <laughs> they were intended. He's very, he's very cute. Well, the main uh, the main character in this film is Louis, your dog. Yes. Your dogs are also in the souvenir. Yeah. You played alongside a dog in Pedro Almodovar's yes. The Human Voice. Do you enjoy acting with dogs? Well, I will say, I will draw a bit of a, a sort of a negative comparison between those experiences. Glorious, though, the experience was of making The Human Voice in every aspect. And glorious, though, that dog is. That dog is a professional actor. And we didn't have a previous relationship. He was really not interested in me at all, very interested in the man who was uh, standing behind me with a sausage in his pocket. And when I worked with uh, my own dogs in the souvenirs, I learned the joy of working with your own dogs. It's so easy because they are really interested in you. Louis's mother, Mother Rosie, who sadly is no longer with us, and Aunt Dora were in the souvenir one, and they were joined in the souvenir... <laughs> I can't believe we're having this conversation. <laughs> they were joined in the souvenir two by Snow Bear, his <laughs> nephew, um, but we were saving Louis for a solo role. He did very well. He carries it, let's face it. He's totally, totally carries it. He is a silent screen star. He is. Yeah. One of your five dogs. One of, well, now four, sadly, but yeah, his mother's no longer. In fact, during the, the making of uh, The Eternal Daughter, Louis also lost his mother, so. Because I'll take experience yes, for. Yes, I think, yeah. Tell you, you've got more than 60 film credits. The really? Of Narnia, yep. Wow. Burn After Reading, Michael Clayton, we need to talk about Kevin, Doctor Strange, Trainwreck, I'm not going to list them all. Yeah, please don't. Can you name one or two characters that always stay with you? Being asked for favourites is a little bit like ask, being asked for a favourite child. But there are certain projects that are really kind of deep projects. A film I made with Sally Potter, Orlando, in the 90s is a very sort of heart project. A film I made with, with Jim Jarmusch, Only Lovers Left Alive. My work with Bong Joon-ho, and then this film I made with uh, Apichat Pong, where it's Ethical Memoria. They sort of pop out of this sofa right now. But I will say, honestly, that The Eternal Daughter kind of goes the deepest in many ways, not just because it's about what it's about, and I made it with my oldest friend but also the way in which Joanna works to not write any dialogue, but for the dialogue to be entirely improvised, I find extremely nourishing. I love to work this way, so it's right up there. And um, Sally Potter's Orlando came out more than 30 years ago now. It's um, the anniversary this year. Where you play a time-travelling, sex-changing figure. <laughs> That's the... That's the line, is it? That's the line. Okay. Well, how would you describe it? Well, the interesting thing is there is a sort of legend about Orlando, the film, but also Virginia Woolf's book, that it's about gender and uh, sex change is sort of the, the, the buzz. But honestly, I think it's not about not interested in gender at all. It's about boundarylessness in every way. Orlando is an English international someone who is trying to live beyond uh, his, her nation, uh, someone who's trying to live beyond the constraints of what her gender might, might mean for other people, and is immortal. And that feeling of uh, a free spirit, I think, is really what that book is about. 
And my fantasy about the book is that if Virginia Woolf had written a few more hundred lines, she probably would have turned Orlando into a spaniel in the next bit. Uh, there's just this feeling of movement. Uh, she's not fixed. Do you think we're maybe reading the gender thing in, especially because in 2023 it's the hot topic? Uh, well, no. I mean, it was ever thus. Even in the days when we made it, and the idea of the gender-free uh, bathroom was just unimaginable. No. If anything, I hope that, you know, recent developments in uh, social history will mean that people will be able to drop it because they'll realize really the wisdom of this book and to a certain extent this film, that it's really about not sweating that small stuff. And I include gender in that. I told you you've got lots of projects coming up. You're working a lot. Um, David Finch's Thriller, The Killer, mm -hmm. um, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. Mm -hmm. In Michelle Yeoh's Oscar acceptance speech, I'm sure you heard it. She said, don't let anyone tell you you're past your prime. Mm. Um, she's in her 60s. Do roles come easily to you? Or do you feel that women have to constantly reinvent themselves to get parts? I don't know how to answer that really in, in any kind of social way, because I don't. I'm in this very particular position of creating projects for myself. Mm. I'm in the fortunate position of not being a professional and waiting for other people to bring things to me. Maybe if one is in that position, then maybe things might feel a little lean at a certain point. But I'm in the very fortunate position of not feeling that. If anything, I'm more focused now than I've been for a while, having had children who have now, you know, become self-sufficient. It's meant that I can be immersed in a project for longer, such as one needs to be when one makes a film like We Need to Talk About Kevin or Orlando or, or any of these films that you, you're carrying, you're in every frame of. That means you are fully immersed for at least six months or a year, which I realized I couldn't be uh, when my children were a certain age. And so for a certain few years, I kind of stepped back a bit and, and, and supported projects that I didn't have to be around for so long. But now that they've flown the coop, I'm re-immersed, so if anything, I feel very much re-engaged. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you very much, Eve. Happy birthday, Mum. To us. <laughs>